for something to leave their mark when life is through but vain pursuits will count for nothing time will erase whatever we do i want my life to count for jesus What was I placed on earth here for? It truly was to build a kingdom, not of my own, but of the Lord's. I want my life to count for Jesus. And toward the other building. I see you there out in the patio area. And uh, I'll do my best if I walk away from this mic to grab this so you can hear out there. Thank you for being here on this uh, Thursday night. Uh, this is always a highlight for me. Um, I, I'm really, uh, I, I'm for work. I work all the time. I work, um, I won't tell you how many hours in a day, but a lot of hours a day. Uh, 12 hours would be an early day. I work long hours. But I always take Thursday off. I mean, I'm very religious about Thursday. I take, and I'll tell you why. Because my wife told me I was going to take Thursday off. <laughs> I'm the head of my house, I'll tell you that right now. But she is the neck that turns the head. And, uh, but I, we always have taken Thursday off. But I tell them, Pastor, this is the thrill for me. I always catch a flight, come down here on this Thursday and preach. And then I, I apologize for this, but I always begin the invitation and leave. And uh, we get to the airport, I catch a flight, and I go back home. And so I'm excited about it. It's going to be interesting. I've not told my wife, and we're not live streaming right now, are we? Oh, she wouldn't know how to get that anyway, I guess. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, I went through the metal detector today. Right before I went through, I said, ah, I took a, just a single key to the front door of the house. I said, put it in this little thing there. And I was bored in the plane. I thought, oh, I left that key. And so if I don't find that key when I get back at the uh, TSA in San Jose, I'm sleeping outside in the backyard tonight. And uh, <laughs> pray that if I knock on the door, she opens it without a shotgun and lets me in the house. You know, um, fellas, you know what? I've learned this. I know if I can come in the house, what I do, I take my hat and I throw it in there. And if it doesn't come thrown back, I know I can go in the house that night, so I'm not sure. But uh, I look forward to, I've looked forward to this all the time. It's a great church. You're great people. And uh, I want to speak to you right directly uh, tonight, just a few moments, about where you find yourself. And uh, I'm thinking about beyond that building to the building you're building. Yeah. And somehow, some way, we have to believe God and finish it. We just have to. And uh, I'm not an expert on a lot of things. 
I don't know how to use a computer. I don't know anything about social media. I'm very ignorant in those things. But I do absolutely know where you're at right now. I've been there many times. I've pastored the same church 40 years. And uh, we built many buildings through those years. And I've been stuck. I don't think you're stuck because you keep moving on this thing. But I've been stuck so many times. And I'm looking forward to try to look at the word of God and speak about something of that nature. Pastor said, can we go to get a bite to eat? And I was excited because I was hungry. And so I went to get a bite to eat. He was in on this. They opened the door at the restaurant, and I had five little grandbabies that were here. And my son-in-law and daughter, Pastor Thompson, is pastoring of uh, Liberty Baptist Church in Newport Beach. And he'd been with me 16 years as my really right-hand man. Our office is right by one another. And uh, he got this crazy notion to leave me. I must be difficult to get along with. I'm not certain. But uh, he went. He's pastoring that great church. And I'd like him to stand, Pastor and Mrs. Thompson. And then right next to him, Ashlyn. Ashlyn is going to be 14. She's single. She's not married. Um, <laughs> then the fellow in the black shirt is Titus. And then next is TJ. And then Trey and Annalise is running the nursery tonight. She's the baby of the family. And thank you. We'll let you be seated. I'm so glad they're here. This is, uh, it's made it special seeing them. We don't get to see them like we want to see them. And uh, I'm just so proud of them. I was singing here, and uh, as I was singing, I was thinking about Tiffany. God blessed us with three children, Tiffany, uh, Tim, and Tabitha. We had the fourth one, we're going to call it letter T, the end, but uh, <laughs> you that are firstborn, I preached a message years ago in our high school, probably 25 years ago, the firstborn has a responsibility to set a direction. Much of your family will mirror what the firstborn does, how they respect mother and dad and obey and how they're kind, and our Tiffany that God brought to us as a miracle. And I'll never forget the day she was born. All of our kids were born in our, in our house, uh, right where we, uh, where we lived all these years. And Tiffany was the first one. We weren't hippies. They just, we just had them at home, you know. And uh, I held her in my arms. And I'll never forget that maybe an hour after she was born, going through the Romans road of salvation with her. And looking at her, she was so beautiful. And I pray that she'd be a good example. Well, she was because our son now has been my assistant and associate for 11 years and a faithful man of God, a great preacher. And he preaches the first Sunday night of every month, the third Sunday morning of every month. And then Tabitha, our baby girl, her husband's the principal there in Sacramento with this honor society tonight. And these kids are giving us 12 grandkids. And I'm I was so glad to see those grandkids. This is a big moment for us. I love you folks here. You're all so very kind. I come in the afternoon. I come on the property always to see what's happening. And there's so many of you young people, and now I'm glad you're coming to college here. And so many of you years ago, before you had a college, came to Golden State. And I see your families, and I see your children, and we're very proud of you. Great, great work that you're doing with your family and in this church. And faithful church members. You know, if you left here, where would you go? My wife and I face that. We talk about it from time to time. If I would go first, or she would go first, I don't know. Our, our kids, pastor, I don't know if we should crash into on their church. I don't know where I'd go. This would be a great church to go. There's very few places I'd want to go. And while you have a church like this, and other churches represent it, when you have a church like this, love it while you have it. And enjoy it. This church, one day, if the Lord tarries, 50, 60, 70 years from now, will destruct Everything leads to corruption. This will corrupt. Every one of our Bible colleges have corrupted. The first one was established in 1638 called Harvard. 
it was a Bible college. And then because it became weak in 1701 in Connecticut, another Bible college started called Yale. And that began to corrupt. And then a place called Princeton by the Presbyterians started. And that began to corrupt. And Brown University, all Ivy League schools, the Baptists started. They've all corrupted. You say, well, if I give money to this project, it's a waste of money. You're not giving money to the church. You're not, I want to say that you're not giving money to the church or to the pastor. You're laying up treasure in heaven. And I don't know what's going to, my wife and I have invested so much financially in our church. And I'll be gone, I hope, off the scene. But one day down the road, it will corrupt. But what, not one building we've given to, did we give necessarily to the building we gave to God. Lay not up for yourselves treasure upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves break through and steal and destroy. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Take your Bibles and when I tell you the text, three years ago we were in this text. It is not the same message. I've never preached this message before. I don't ever plan to preach this message again. God laid this on my heart for Pacific Baptist Church tonight. And I hope it will be a help out there in the patio area and in the side over here and all throughout the house. Exodus 32. It's not a positional message. It's, it's a message for your church, this church where you're at. Brother Joseph, I gave you my wallet and my phone. Now you gave it to your brother. Who'd you give it to? I'm watching you. You got my wallet and phone? <laughs> You keep your hands up like this all during preaching, all right? They're good boys, great. On Saturday night at 8.20, I always speak 8.20 or 8.25 live on our radio broadcast, and it literally goes around the globe. We have 100 countries every day listening, and we always give a report about Brother Esposito, and we pray for him. I promised this morning early, Brother Keith Gomez called me and he said, Brother Traber, you pray for me. And I promised I'd told, tell the people here, Brother Gomez is younger than I, but his wife passed away about eight years ago. And now this past week, his son passed away. And their viewing is tonight, the visitation. He preaches the funeral tomorrow in Illinois. I hope you'll pray for him. And I promised Brother, uh, uh, in Gaylord, Michigan there, Brother Jenkins, his boy had major surgery, a married young fella. Uh, pancreas problems, and uh, you pray for him as well. Pastor went to school with him. So I love you, folks. Well, your Bibles tonight. Our Father, I thank you for the people of God. I thank you for the churches that are represented here tonight and this great church that's just packing this place out. And Father, I'm th so thankful for the building that's under construction It would be so wonderful to have the money to complete it. Our Father, these dear people have given and sacrificed and they've been patient. But now it's beginning to get to be a long project. May they not lose sight of the fact that soon they're going to be in that auditorium, Amen. those classrooms, that gymnasium. And soon they'll look back and say, God, you did this. It's marvelous. May we not be weary in well-doing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Your Bibles tonight, Exodus chapter 20. Moses is up on the mountain. God told him to go there. He's going to give them the commandments. And Exodus chapter, did I say 20? Exodus 32, 20, 20 is the commandments. I thought I heard you turning there. You listen too much. You really don't need to listen that much when a preacher <laughs> preaches. Exodus 32, if you want to go to 20, or if you want to go to 75, whatever chapter you want to go to, it's okay. And when the people saw that Moses delayed, and that's what I want to speak to you about tonight. When Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the 
man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We want not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the, there it is again, the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron and received them at their hand and fashioned a graving tool and he made a molten calf. And he said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation. And he said, Tomorrow's a feast unto the Lord. What a foolish thing. He gets his false God, and yet he says, we're going we're to glorify God with this false God. In the text, as we read it, Moses has been commanded by God to get alone with God. He walks with God for 40 days. And in those 40 days, the people of God become impatient. I know something about this, and a shepherd would know something about it. Brother Myers has said the people have been so great here. Just nothing but complimentary. But I've built so many buildings with our people through the years, and every one has been a delay. Every one we ran out of money. Every one there have been obstacles. Every one the city came in and sort of dealt with us sometimes rather difficult difficult measures. They've not been easy. Nothing is easy if it's worth value. Raising children is not easy. And my wife told our Sunday school class of young couples here a few weeks ago, you're at the easiest moment. Our kids all raised and we're so proud of them. I tell you what, as parents, and we've got five grandkids here, two kids, we are so proud and thankful but I tell you, we live together in prayer. The first prayer after I pray for some things in my life and my marriage are our kids and grandkids, and they captivate my life. And then later in the morning, I'm saying, Lord, right now, uh, Titus and TJ are in the car. They're going to, they're going to school right now. Ashton's going to school right now. And the little kids are at home, and our kids are there going to school. They have captivated. We're concerned for all of them, their education their health, their friends, their church, their school, everything, their Sunday. I pray, I don't know, I don't know their Sunday school teachers here, but I pray that God, you would use their Sunday school teacher to realize they're shaping our grandkids now more than I am. And their school teachers. Moses is walking with God. And the people saw he delayed. Delay is never fun. It's never enjoyable. I, I could say it. I thought this thing through so many times in the last several weeks. I want to say this. It's a little harsh. I hate delay. <laughs> that lady driver, uh, that man driver in front of me. Lady, who did you hear what I almost Uh-oh. say? Uh-oh. What I said almost. Uh, 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 that driver in front of me going slow. <laughs> that bothers me. Get a move on. Either go with the flow or get off the road. Good night. Let's move this thing. I think by nature I'm Peter. Peter's impatient. He's my hero. I don't like delay. And consequently, it seems like God always lets me delay. Because our God is a patient God. And if I'm to be what I should be, God is going to allow me to enjoy delay. I think of one illustration. Forty years ago, when my wife and I went to our church, I began to pray immediately before I even got there, Lord, I'd like you to give me a 15-minute radio broadcast every day to speak to the people from my church in our valley. It was not called the Silicon Valley then. It was called the Santa Clara Valley. And I said, Lord, I want to speak to them every day. And I don't know if I could tell you I prayed every day, but I believe I did. Every day, God, give me a radio station, a radio program. And I prayed a year, and nothing happened. 
I'm a little frustrated now after a year of praying. No 15-minute broadcast. I prayed two years, and two turned into five. And I said, Lord, I don't understand this. Our church is exploding. We're growing 100 a year. It's exciting. It's moving. We're building. We're, we're, we're never, we've never had enough room to put all the people in one area. We're, we're out the doors. We had people in those early days just like this. I built a, a, a room for the adult classes, and I put them all in there. And, and we, we put chairs in the back. And as they came in, we filled them all the way up to the window. And then I'd go on the outside, rain or shine, they'd pull the window out. I'd teach from the outside to those on the inside. I prayed for five years and no radio program. Seven years. Ten years. Twelve years. Fifteen years. Twenty years. At times I say, God, is it me? What's wrong with me? God, I, I really believe you want this. God, would you please, would you please give us a station that I could have a broadcast that, that, that now it's called the Silicon Valley by the time that I'd prayed so many years. And God, it's 25 years and I want to reach these people. 30 years. On 30 years without picking up a phone, one day, God did not give us one station, but he gave us 90. One day. I found out last week, several stations have been reading through the call letters of Virginia and West Virginia and Wisconsin and Minnesota and, and Florida. I've been reading through every day a few of the stations uh, and call letters and I call out to them just start this about a week ago. And I, I just go around the country and then on Virgin Islands and then we have a station in Canada. We have uh, 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 on the short wave and then the internet on top of all that. I, I didn't realize that I found out we had another, and we didn't even know it. We had another nine stations we found out last week. We didn't even know we had. I wanted the station the first year. I wanted the program the first year. It's been 10 years now. And to God be the glory, I've never missed one day on the broadcast in 10 years. God's given me enough health to get through that. I really believe I know what you're going through because as I walked through that building this year, last year, year before, it, it, the smell of building, I love the smell. If they could bottle that for cologne, that would be my cologne. <laughs> I love it. That's, I love Come it. On. But I walked in there again today and I said, I've been, in, I said to myself, and said, I've been at this point so many times. I had an uncle that was building one of our first buildings, 32,000 square foot building. And I'll never forget as we were building that the building before that he built was a 4,000 square foot building. And I'll never forget we were building that building. And he said, son, he's with the Lord now. He said, Jack, we will just build till we run out of money. And on Saturday night, many a Saturday night, we were down to the hundreds of dollars, $300. And I said, I'm going to pull the plug. He said, don't pull the plug. He said, we'll go to the offering tomorrow. Let's see what God does. And every week God did something. You know, tonight as we look at what God's talking about, delay, and everything in my life has always been delayed, whether buildings or finances or equipment or buses or radio or housing, it's all delayed. My wife and I went there and we were married a few years already before that and I kept praying, God, give us a house. How in the world could I afford a house of $30,000? I can't afford that. And then the houses were 50 and then they were 100. And those same houses I was praying for now are right at a million. God did not give us a house the first year or the first five or the first 10 or the first 15, but on the 18th year, God gave us a house. God always seems to work with me by the avenue of delay. I wish you wouldn't have to delay. But tonight I want us to see just a few thoughts 
Why does God delay? Why does God delay? He who spoke this world into existence, why, after six days, he had the whole thing done? One of our preachers was preaching on Wednesday night a few weeks ago. I, I need to tell you this because he said, can you imagine what heaven's going to be like? He built this beautiful planet in six days. He's been building heaven for 2,000 years. I think I want to go. Why does God delay? I want to point out to you that he is trying to get us on his timetable. Turn with me, if you will, to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. As you turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, let me just remind you, Ecclesiastes follows uh, Proverbs. God's word says, to everything there's a, a season and a time to every purpose in heaven, a time to be born and a time to die and a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, and a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones and a time, I told my college president, this was my life verse when I was in college, a time to embrace and he said, mine is a time to refrain from embracing, Jack. A time to get, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, a time to speak, a time to love, a time of hate, a time of war, a time of peace. Verse 11, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Amen. Friend, it's not God getting on my timetable. It's me getting on God's timetable. Isaiah 55, verse 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. My goal in life is not to try to force God in the corner, which I cannot do, and say, I demand you, you come through. My goal is to find God where he is and where he wants me to be. And he is always, always, always a perfect time. We have the song in our hymn book, have before you at a time of God's own choosing he came when we the fight were losing he came long before we knew him when we were lost in sin here it is at the right time at the best time he came Galatians 4 4 in the fullness of time God sent forth his son and by the way, it says in due time, and he came to die for the, the ungodly. God sent his son on God's time to die for my sin. I want to say tonight that, that God is trying to get me on his timetable. He took Joseph to a prison to get him on his timetable. He took them for, to a foreign land to get him on his timetable. He took a man by the name of Daniel to, to, to a foreign land to get him on his timetable. God has a perfect time. God was not giving Mrs. Treber and I children. And we pray. And I know she prayed, but I, was, I wanted to be a father and I'd pray. But I guarantee it. We came to a point, we said, God, we want your will for our lives. One month short of seven years, God gave us Tiffany. And four years later, God gave us Brother Tim. And then 13 months later, people say, well, we have our kids every two years. Well, God bless you. We have ours every 25 years apart or something like that. I don't know when they come. I don't know why God did it that way, but I tell you what, I'm grateful that God had a timetable. I know that God has a right time. You know, God already has seen the opening Sunday. He said, well, I can't see it. Well, of course you can't see it because we cannot see what God can see. If we could see beyond today as God could see, if we knew what was ahead of us for the days ahead, the great, great joys and the great, great sorrows, we didn't really know that that day 
when we came home from church and we listened to the voicemail and said, call the hospital. We didn't realize our niece would be in a car accident and killed that day by the family farm. We didn't realize that was happening. On the same road that my wife's uncle at age 16 died in a car accident. I, I, didn't, I don't know some of the things I've, that kept me up at night awake. If I'd have known them, I'd have gone to that day fear. But I also did not know the great blessings that God would give. Right. I'll never forget that night that our sweet daughter, and forgive me for, I'll, I won't talk again after this, but she went to the hospital and, 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 and I went to El Camino Hospital. I'll never forget that morning seeing our firstborn granddaughter. It was just deja vu going back to when her mother was born. I looked at her and I thought, I just can't believe this. She's so beautiful. Brother Thompson has a younger brother. and I'll never forget the day that his mother gave birth to that boy. And I was there. I saw on the day one I could tell it wasn't right. It wasn't normal. I wanted to say something, but I knew the doctors would, and sure enough, Down syndrome. He's 22 now. That boy does not have a normal life like you and I have. But he is the joy of our church. Yeah. Amen. Every Sunday night, he starts knocking on that door about 5.30 in my study, in my ready room there, knocks on that door. If I'm with somebody, he'll come back five minutes later and knock on that door. He's such a, such a wonderful boy. He loves me to death. I love him. Robert, yeah. he comes in, and every Sunday night, he'll say, okay, let's pray. He's so sweet about it. He prays for me every Sunday night. And he'll pray something like this because he's so enamored with youth conferences. But he'll start, and I'm not trying to be a blessed pastor. And he goes on about me preaching that night. And he always says, a youth conference. He loves youth conference. I tell you what, I would miss it if I didn't hear that boy pray every Sunday night. Amen. Had we known the day he was born as he was expected, who, who wants to face that? But I tell you what, I won't change one thing about that boy. Amen. He's brought joy to my life and joy to his family and joy to our church. He amens at the right place. When other men are sleeping, he's amening. Why does God delay? Why does God delay to get me on his timetable? God has a timetable. Stop for I'm, I'm gonna stop praying. Why? God says, keep on praying. Pray without ceasing. Man ought always to pray and not to faint. Why does God delay trying to get me on his timetable? Secondly, turn with me to James, if you would. James chapter 1. He's trying to get me on his timetable. Secondly, he's trying to do something in my life. Don't miss this. He's trying to do something in my life. God had... Moses walking up on that mountain for 40 days. Don't you think those two tablets were done in 40 days? I mean, God called, called this world to exist. Don't, it did not take 40 days. They were undoubtedly finished when he got there or somewhere along the line. Or when it was all done, it was just there. It wasn't like God was etching out of stone the Ten Commandments. But God needed Moses to walk with them. Yeah. And for 40 days, he walked with God. God was doing something in Moses' life. Can you imagine what it was to be in the presence of God? He was going to need that for the remainder of his journey, leading these Jews and my Bible says in James chapter 1, my brethren, count it all joy 
when you fall into divers temptation or different trials, knowing this, that the trial of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire and wanting nothing. Patience deals with endurance. God, for some reason, is trying to do something for this church. I would not have done it this way. I would have trotted somebody in those doors or those doors or those doors or through those windows. I would have trotted somebody in and said, uh, here's $10 million. Just get it done and do it like you want it. God could have. But then again, you would not have had the investment. And you would not have had the walk with God. And you would not have had the prayer with God. And you would not have had the faith in God. God is building your faith. God's trying to do something in your life. Yes, sir. My mother used to always say, son, I'd get disappointed with things. She'd say it all the time. Our disappointments are God's appointments. God knows what he's doing. That breathtaking, in my estimation, one of the most gorgeous buildings, church buildings in America. I wish we could hook it up to the plane and take it with me tonight. <laughs> it's beautiful. It is beautiful. God knows why he wants you to wait. I wonder, I, I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something. Because God never sits in heaven in a rocking chair half asleep. His eyes are ever open. He's doing something. I don't know what he's doing. But not only is he getting me on his timetable, he's doing something in my life. He's building a man of God. He's building the people of God. Uh, you say, I would do it differently. That's why you're not God. God is trying to do something in your home. God is trying to do something with his children. It's an amazing thing how many young men out of our church have said, we're having this campaign in our church, or we're doing this, or we're raising money this way. And they'll all say, you know where I got that idea? Yeah, I do. I remember we did it. And I probably got it from somewhere else. God's doing something, friend. And when God is doing something, don't rush God. Amen. That building project I told you, and I won't be long now, that building project, I told you, 32,000 square feet. I can recall when we began to build it. I led the church in tearing down a building in 1981 that we had built in 1978, 77. We built this building, but it was in the way of this 32,000 square foot building. And I got an idea to put a tent up. I promised them we were going to meet one year in that tent. And I'll never forget, it was on Sunday night, I said, folks, we're going to, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to, I'm just building right here. Can't hear you in the back. We're, I didn't want to tell them we we're going to tear the building down we had just built. And I'll never forget a guy, when I said, we're going to tear that building down. What are we going to, what are we going to do? And I stutter almost every time. We're going to build a big building right there. One guy said, where will we meet? I said, right over here. We're going to tear that house down over here in this area, and we're going to move this thing around, and we're going to meet in a tent. Where will we park? <laughs> There'll be zero parking, zero. There'll be not one parking stall, not one, and there wasn't. What will it cost? $550,000. How long will it take? 52 weeks. It took 104 weeks. And it get, did not cost 550000 It cost $1.2 million. I was wrong. It was twice as long and twice as much. They should have fired me. But we were two in this thing. And we were in it together. And without one parking stall in those two years, we grew another 200 people. God would bring them in. One Sunday school class, I look at now the property we're at now, we're off of that, pro we still have that property, but I look at that property, out my window there's a tree, and at that tree is where sixth grade boys met for two years under the tree, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, it never rained one time, 10 o'clock Sunday morning. 
God was building my faith. God was building the faith of our people. This auditorium that we have now, it's a beautiful auditorium. And I look at that vast auditorium and I walk in there through the week and especially on Saturday nights and I just walk with God and pray in there. It's just breathtaking. Lights are off. The cross and the pulpit down below, you can see it. And I had it all planned. I thought we could get that thing done in three years. And I raised three and a half million dollars cash. We're ready to go. But then the city wanted an environmental impact report. And then we needed this, and then we needed this, and then we needed to have this. And it took 10 years. Every Sunday at the door, put money in that parking meter. We had a parking meter. Put money in, that, in those jugs. Put money in the offering plate. It took 10 years of my life. One-fourth of the 40 years of my life was spent in that building. And after it was built, and the city said it's the carpet's in, the water's on, the million and a half dollar air conditioning and heater's in, said you can't use it. And for the next one year, a completed building set empty. Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They said we want you to pull the carpet back and saw up the concrete wall, the floors on the second floor, put expansion joints in. We want you to saw up the walls that are all completed, all painted, all finished, all the trim work. I want you to saw them up and put expansion joints for earthquakes. And another million and a half dollars. And we were tired and worn out with that project. But guess what? We're in the building for now almost 10 years. Amen. I'd say, number one, why is God delaying to trying to get us on his timetable? He's trying to do something in my life and in your life, and that's what God's trying to do with that building. Amen. Three, I want you to know there are always going to be reversals. I won't take the time for all the scriptures for the sake of time. I think you're normally out about this time. There's always reversals. Brother Kevin, who's here, I don't know where you're at. It's the new name we have now. But, but he could tell you of all the reversals. It's almost that every day there's a negative reversal every day. We're getting ready to build this building, and our architect died. So we got the next architect. We didn't realize he negotiated with the city to cut off 50, uh, 60 feet of the platform that way. So our baptistry is so high. And that's why these two side sections sort of have an angle to them because they, they're, they're supposed to angle out this way. It, it was all wrong. We didn't know that he had negotiated that. And the next architect, we had a fire, and the next one was a fraud, and we had four of them before it was over. And I had four different builders too. And one lost his license, and one was a corrupt man cost us a lot of money, wasted money. And the thing spiraled out of control. The next man quit. He said, it's just too big. I can't finish this thing. And the building's up like yours. It's up like yours. And the steeple, 94 feet in the air, is up. And he walks off the project. And the next guy came in and said, I'll help you finish it. Those were try out some days because we had all the trades in there, crews there. We had to sit them down hoping and any one of them could suit us because they signed with the original uh, 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 architect and the original builder and now they don't want to be liable. They could have walked. I have big meeting. I'll never forget about 40 contractors in there. Oh, I'll never forget that day. I, I want to say you're going to have some reversals. You're not done yet. I don't know what else is going to be thrown. You say, come on. Lastly, it will always get finished. If you'd go back and read the remainder of the book of Exodus, God accomplished what God wanted to accomplish in Moses' life, 
And then the next man he was building, Joshua's life. It always gets done. It always does. That building will get finished. You cannot tell me how, and I cannot tell you how. You cannot tell me if God will send an angel. You say, what are you talking about? Angels are real. We were stuck on a project 30 years ago. Water was coming into the school. I was squeezing it out every morning of my life. And throughout the day, if it was ever raining, the city finally came in and said, you can't have your school here. And to God be the glory, that same day they said that, we got a public school. And for the next two years, we had a public school for next to nothing. I mean, an official public school. They had moved off. We had moved in. And I came to the church on a Wednesday night. It was raining so hard in that tent, raining so hard. And I said, folks, I don't know how to tell you this. I think it was $10,000. I said, I've got to have $10,000 tonight. I've got to have it. We've got to close in that rough structure and then plastic it down. We just got, we have to, we just get plywood up there. We've got to do this. There's no, and I took an offering. I don't think we had $500 given. They were, they, they, were, they were out of money. I, I tapped the well dry. We were building that building. The man, every Monday after work, our wives would come with food. They'd bring the children. You see your dad, and the dad would work till 10 o'clock. Every Tuesday, the same. Every Thursday uh, night, every Friday, a small crew. And then all day Saturday, the ladies ran the bus routes. I, I didn't know how to get it done, and... I said, folks, on this night, I've, it's pouring down rain tonight. I've got to have this $10,000. After night, I, I walked out. I didn't know what to do. This thing's going to fall apart. It's going to warp out there. I've got to get plastic on it. God, what do I do? I mean, I was, about, I was just overwhelmed. This young man, what, what's going to happen here? I'll never forget a man. I have no idea what he even looks like. Talking back to you, uh, thinking about it. But he came and he said, how much do you need? I think I told him 10000 He said, I'll be here in the morning. Never saw him before that. I think God sent an angel. I do. Yeah. The next morning he showed up. He gave us $10,000. I have no idea what his name was. It was cash. I don't know if he stole it from somebody. I really didn't care if he stole it, quite frankly. I can confess it later. I want to tell you something. God increased my faith. I could talk to you all night about that. God's delayed us on everything. God always delays me. He always has. We built straight for 30 years. In the last 10 years, he's delayed me because I'm paying off mortgages. I don't like it. I wish somebody by now could have come in there and said, here's $20 million. Just we'll take care of everything for you. It's not worked that way. But God always has a timetable. He's trying to get me on it. So he delays me. And God's trying to build me and my people. So he delays. And God's kind of trying to teach me through reversals that I don't like that, but that's what you need, son. But I know God always gets it done. He always gets it done. There was a deacons meeting in our church several years ago. We were stuck on a project. Most of my deacons have been with me a lifetime been there a long time. Some of the younger guys have been there maybe 10 years or so. I knew that night I'd prayed, I'd walked with God. I thought I was going to tell the deacons we're pulling the plug. I cannot, I cannot move this project forward. I've raised, I've raised, I've raised. We're out of money. It's not money's coming in. And that night I stood before the deacons 
I have 36 godly deacons. I think at that time I was in the 20s. 20 some deacons and I said, fellas, I want to talk to you tonight. I was trying to be as strong as I could about this building project. And I just want to tell you not only where we're at, we have no money, but I just want to talk to you about it. Brother Thompson, you know, Brother Paul, Paul Skirty said, uh, Pastor, excuse me, Matt, may, may I say a word before you say a word? And I felt like saying, no. <laughs> I know I'm a jerk. I know I'm a failure. I know I've done wrong. And I know I led this church in this project and we can't get it finished. I know that. I don't have to. And none of my deacons have ever been that way. But you know, you start seeing ghosts. And he said, I don't know what pastor's going to tell us tonight. But I've been with them almost since day one. And I tell you what, when he said God was going to provide, I, I knew God wasn't going to provide. And every time for these 30 years I've been there, he said, God did. And I don't know what he's going to tell us, but fellas, I just ask that we be in an attitude of prayer because whatever vision he has to finish this building, let's follow him. Y'all, hey, amen. I'm pulling the plug, boys. Another man raised his hand and said, I, I want to echo what Brother Paul said. I have more faith and more courage today than ever before because I've watched Pastor, his great faith. <laughs> I, I have no faith. In fact, if another church would ask me to come be their pastor, I'm leaving. You guys finish this building by yourself. I, I don't even want, and I'd say God led me. Can't understand it, but God just led me to leave. And he said, I agree with Brother Paul. Follow God's man. And, and those men went around the room and said, here's, here's a time my faith was so weak, and I watched Pastor, and he led us. The last guy said, Pastor, we've talked for a while now. We've prayed now for a while together. Tell us your vision. What would you say? I'm not going to tell them I was going to pull the plug. I'm not going to. I didn't tell them that for years. I said, here's what I think we need to do, fellas. I think we need to intensify our prayer power. <laughs> that was the plan. I feel like we need to pray more than ever. I do pray. I do. It's somebody would walk through these doors and say, here's the check. I think this church is deserving of that. You've had banquet after banquet. I wish it could happen. But God's probably going to use you again. Just keep it going. Amen. Because you're going to have an opening Sunday at that auditorium. They're saying it is going to be so wonderful. Amen. And you're going to say, here's our problem. We built too small. <laughs> our Father, these are 